front lawns. What a crowd we have here this afternoon for the session 52 Ways of Looking at a Poem. We have one additional guest on the lineup, so please join me in welcoming Arvind Krishna Marotra, along with Jeet Tail, Vijay Shishadri, Kevin Powers, Neil Rennie, Ashok Vajpayee, and Ruth Padel. And this session includes the announcement of the winner for the Kushwan Singh Memorial Prize for Poetry. Please give them all a very, very warm so, hey, welcome. Good to see you. Dear friends, seeing this sea of faces in front of me, I know that there are lots of poetry lovers, young and old, at the Jaipur Literature Festival, at the Z Jaipur Literature Festival. And I'm proud to announce the first prize, the first Kushwan Singh Memorial Prize for poetry. And with me is two members of the jury. I'm one of the jury and Ashok Vajpai and Jeet Thayil. Give a big hand for the first. So he, the prize has been instituted by Suhail Seth. He'll tell you for a second what it's about and why he's done this. I first met Kushwan Singh in 1982 and we did a book and after that he was my drinking partner till he died. <laughs> I have to tell you, you never make better friendships other than over scotch. But Kushwan was a great believer in prose and an equal believer in poetry. And I have to say to Sonjoy, to Namitha, to William for allowing us to announce the winner of the Kushwan Singh Memorial Prize for Poetry. There isn't a prize for poetry in India yet. It honors a man who lived by the pen and died by scotch. And there can be no better definition of a great man like Kushwan Singh. I'm delighted that all of you are here to celebrate the winner of the first Kushwan Singh Memorial Prize. And the winner is Arundhati Subramaniam. Oh, wow. Please applaud. I also have to thank the members of the jury. Three of them are here, Namita Gokhale, Jeet, and Ashok Vajpayeeji. Soli Sarabji is not here. Pavan Varma is still saving Nitish Kumar. Other than that, we have a packed house. Arundhati Subramaniam. Wow. I've always thought of prizes as things that happen to other people. So this feels a bit unreal right now. I'd like to thank the jury because it's really been a wonderfully strong shortlist. And I'd also like to say that poetry today is just such a muted form that uh, poets can sometimes end up feeling a little inconsequential and unheard. Inconsequential is not a bad thing always, but unheard is not very nice. So an award like this is far more affirming than what might imagine. I want to thank uh, the jury, but I'd also like to say I'm very grateful that something like the Kushwan Singh Poetry Prize has been instituted, because it's a reminder that uh, in some way, this art of murmurs and whispers still counts. Thank you. Uh, before I invite two of our esteemed jury members who are here, I just want to say this is a prize for any poet. So if you have a poet within you, you must apply for the prize. It is democratic. There's no ghar wapsi. There's just the mind. <laughs> May I invite Jeet? And after that, the legendary Ashok Vajpayeeji. Congratulations. Poets uh, have a joke they like to tell each other because, you know, poets are a bit like doctors. We have black humor. It's the only way we can deal with the neglect we face in daily life. Uh, poets have a joke we like to tell each other. We say at poetry readings where there are two poets or three poets, we say if the 
audience outnumbers the poets, you're doing good. Um, I have to say, this is amazing. It gives me great pleasure to be part of the jury that awarded the first Kushwan Singh Memorial Prize for Poetry. Uh, this year's shortlist was extremely formidable. It had depth. Uh, each book was worthy of winning the prize, so it wasn't easy to choose the winner. Our winner, I think, deserves every accolade she deserves. Um, the book, I'm sure, will go on to win other prizes. Uh, I think she has set a very high bar for the Kushwan Singh Prize. Uh, Arundhati Subramanian. Thank you very much. May I now invite uh, Ashok Vajpayee ji. And I have to tell you this, when I decided on the prize, we were all around a table drinking scotch. <laughs> I keep reaffirming scotch is a great virtue. Well, friends, it was, it was due because an impression has gone around that Indians are writing very good fiction in English, but they aren't writing good poetry in English. And I think when this prize was instituted, we discovered that there are many important voices articulating themselves in English poetry from India. It was tough deciding which one to choose, but we chose Arundhati Subramanian both for her uh, emotional rigor and linguistic innovative zeal. It's not a poetry which is, which is uh, quiet or, and yet it has silences. In other times where there are so many noises of all kind, including of garbapsi or whatever, it's good to stop for a moment and listen to that pure, simple, and holy voice of poetry telling you how in our difficult times it is possible to be human. Thank you. As they'd say in the Olympics, let the games begin. Okay. <laughs> good, good, good. Well, I think we should start this by one more round of applause for Arundhati. Um, <laughs> and perhaps I want to start with two words that came out of these last five minutes. One was Arundhati's own phrase, the art of murmurs. And another one, which was what Jeet said, this neglected art. Now, it is fantastic for me, coming from England, where in English literary festivals... Oh, could you... You couldn't hear at all, is that right? Okay, start again. Um, it's fantastic for me, in coming from England, where English literary festivals, poetry is politely put somewhere in a corner. It's given a cafe or a little tent somewhere, and a few people go and hear it. What you are is just fantastic. And I was wondering why, because poetry is a portable art, it's an it's a uneconomical art, and that's one reason why other poetry festivals don't highlight it. But then I realized, this is a free festival. So, and poetry is the art of um, thinking free and of not minding about the money. So um, I just wanted to read you one little thing which a poet wrote over 400 years ago. This was Sir Philip Sidney. He wrote in the beginning of his work an apology for poetry in 1595. That is before Milton's parents met and before Shakespeare wrote Hamlet. And he called his work a pitiful defense of poor poesy, which from being almost the highest estimation of learning is fallen to be the laughing stock of children. Well, you are here to prove that is not the case, and I'm delighted to meet you. Well, bef 
before we start talking about poetry, it was decided by democratic vote among these poets that they would each like to give you a one minute poem. So I think some of them will and some of them won't. But Ashok, can we start with you, please? No, please start there. Oh. <laughs> All right, I'll start if you like. <laughs> um, Jeet, why don't you start? No, I hate to start. Why don't you start? I'll start. All right. Okay. Take the mic because they can't hear these poems. This is not a poem of my own. I don't have my poetry with me. And uh, I won't read it in public anymore. But this is the first poem I ever memorized. And uh, if all of you love poetry, you should memorize it. And it's called The Song of the Master and the Boatswain. And it's from W.H. Auden's book, The Sea in the Mirror, which is based on The Tempest. At Dirty Dicks and Sloppy Joes, we drank our liquor straight. Some went upstairs with Marjorie and some, alas, with Kate. And two by two, like cat and mouse, the homeless played at keeping house. Their wealthy Meg, the sailor's friend, and Marion cow-eyed, opened their arms to me, but I refused to step inside. I was not looking for a cage in which to mope in my old age. The nightingales are sobbing in the orchards of our mothers, and hearts that we broke long ago have long been breaking others. Tears are round, the sea is deep, roll them overboard and sleep. <laughs> Kevin, Kevin Powers. Oh, thank you. I, I wasn't expecting to have to follow Auden, but uh, <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> here it goes. This is, uh, I'm just incredibly thrilled to see so many people for uh, a poetry session. It's just magnific magnificent. And I'll read one of the few poems that are close to love poems that I've written. It's called Valentine with Flat Affect. Everybody knows the number of things to be in love with is reducing at a rate more or less equal to the expansion of the universe. This is called entropy, I think. Some things are, however, left. You and that gingham dress for one for which I will not apologize to anyone for loving. Other aspects of a life become prioritized by chance, and our mistake is that we guess that every ground must break along the fault that it is given. So no, I don't care as much about the fish I pulled out of the river in a net as I do you. Most of what I catch slips back between the empty spaces in the old net anyway. It's hard enough to find my footing, let alone decide what to call remarkable, and not just because I am fed and clothed and not unreasonably happy. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. Um, since we are in North India, I'm going to read a ghazal. Uh, and I apologize that it's in English, because, you know, ghazals shouldn't be in English. Um, I don't really apologize. This is Malayalam's ghazal. Not only is it an, a ghazal in English, it's a ghazal that dares to put the word Malayalam in its title. I apologize doubly. <laughs> Listen, someone's saying a prayer in Malayalam. He says, there's no word for despair in Malayalam. At daybreak, you open... I'm sorry. Sometimes at daybreak, you sing a Gujarati Garba. At night, you open your hair in Malayalam. To understand symmetry, understand Kerala, the longest palindrome is there in Malayalam. When you've been too long in the rooms of English, open your windows to the fresh air of Malayalam. Visitors are welcome to the school of lost tongues. 
someone has endowed a high chair in Malayalam. I greet you, my ancestors, O oh scholars and linguists, my father who recites Baudelaire in Malayalam. Jeet, such drama with the scraps you know. Write a couplet, if you dare, in Malayalam. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm going to read a sonnet um, in celebration of the headlines this week that the tiger population in India has gone up by 30%. All right. <laughs> All right. Tiger drinking at forest pool. Water, moonlight, danger, dream. Bronze urn angled on a tree root, one slash of light, then gone. A red moon seen through clouds or almost seen. Treasure found but lost, flirting between the worlds of lost and found. An unjust law repealed, a wish come true, a lifelong sadness healed. Haven to the mind for anyone hurt by littleness. A prayer for the moment saved, treachery forgiven, flame of the crackle glazed tangle, amber reflected in grey milk jade, an old song remembered, long debt paid, a painting on silk which may fade. Uh, I'll read a, a poem which is called Hoopo. Hoopo is a, is a bird which we, and I saw it pecking outside in the drive in the Radun where I live last about two, two years ago during the, in the, in the, in the rainy season. Hoopo. Who remembers my dentist father now that even his patients are dead? A hoopoe pecks at the sodden ground beside the latched gate on which is hung a rusted signboard with his name and clinic R's, the letters illegible and getting more so. Like a spark of fire in the air, the hoopoes vanished into the trees, leaving the patch of earth a little dark where it came looking for grubs. It's been raining. We belong to the houses we live in. Um, I didn't bring my book, uh, and my poetry is unmemorable, even by myself. Uh, and that was not a poem, so I'm passing the microphone on. Oh. Well, uh, you know, I write in Hindi, so I'm, I'm re going to read a short poem in Hindi. Kya <laughs> chahiye? तुम्हें जीने के लिए कम से कम क्या चाहिए थोड़ी सी रोटी कुछ नमक पानी एक बसेरा एक दरी एक चादर एक जोड़ी कपड़े एक थैला दो चप्पलें कुछ शब्द एक आध पुस्तक कुछ गुनगुनाहट दो चार फूल मात्र स्मृति दूर चला गया बचपन पास आती मृत्यु तुम्हें कविता करने के लिए क्या चाहिए बहुत सारा जीवन पूर्वज प्रेम आंसू अपमान लोगों का शोरगुल अरण्य का एकांत भाषा का घर लय का अंतरिक्ष रोटी का टुकड़ा नमक की डली पानी का घड़ा और निर्दय आकाश Oh, yeah. no, it's on, it's on. Okay, so, um, well, poetry is about communication, and this is our medium of communication. And I wanted to start, talk out, start out by talking a little bit about the media and what the media mean. This panel, I didn't expect it, but this panel is called after a book I wrote about 10 years ago called 52 Ways of Looking at a Poem. And it came out of a newspaper column 
And I started this column, I said to the literary editor, I think I'd love to try and do, people think poetry is difficult and they don't know where to start in the modern world looking at, you know, there are so many books in the bookshop, they all say they're wonderful, how do I begin? And anyway, it's difficult. Um, so could I, could I try writing a little piece about a poem and putting it in your paper? And she said, that's a great idea. She was a girl who loved poetry. The editor of the paper said, that's a terrible idea. Nobody likes poetry, and they certainly don't want to write reading about poetry, read writing about poetry. We did a pilot, we did a six. The readers loved them, and they wanted more. And it wasn't because I particularly wrote well, it was just that they, I was setting out how you might approach this poem so that other people could find their own ways of reading the poem. And the readers started writing letters to the paper saying, make this longer, have it every week, and the editors were so surprised that they let the literary editor have it. But a lot of people in the paper, in the, went, it went against the philosophy of what a newspaper is for and what a newspaper reader wants. And in fact, some of the people even accused me of writing these letters to them. Um, they said they were all written by Ruth Bedell. Um, but it went on and on, and I, for about four years, I got about seven to 10 letters a week they wanted to know about the poem, they dropped my piece in the bath and they wanted to remember which poem it was. And so eventually I put them in a book. And what does this tell us really about the relation of the media to the poem? I'm going to ask our, 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 my distinguished colleagues in a minute. Um, media comes from the word between. Media get between the reader and the world and they do it fast, they want it unambiguous, and they think that the reader has very short attention span. In fact, as you, the presence of all of you here today and poetry festivals all over the world prove there are thousands of readers, hundreds and thousands of readers who want to take the time that a poem takes to read. They want to think about it, they want to memorize it sometimes. So there is an interesting disjunct between what newspaper editors want to think that people want and what people actually do want. So I'd like to start, maybe start with, um, well, let's go around this way, Ashok, because you're our intermediary, you and Arvid are our intermediary here, or, or we all have different intermediaries between the audience. So what do you think um, how do you think, what role does poetry play here today in the societies you belong to? Well, I, you know, about 17 years ago, uh, an editor of a Hindi newspaper approached me and wanted to, me to write a weekly column. And I said, no, no, I can't possibly be writing a weekly column. I'll write once in a while. So the column was called Kabhi Kabhar and I started writing it, and I have been writing it every week now. And it is about poetry, about music, about visual arts and my travels or what you have. And I translate um, from poetry of the world. And on the last Sunday every year, because there is a critical survey of what happened during the year, that column doesn't appear. On, only on the last Sunday. So it, there are 51 uh, columns uh, in a year. And I get about 20 phone calls from all over India asking me, am I all right? Why is it that I haven't written? And I try to explain. So the notion, unfortunately, in large sections of Indian media, and especially in Hindi, Hindi ke sare sampadak sahitya vimudh sampadak hain. Wo na to sahitya ko samajhte hain aur na ye chahte hain ki koi aur samjhe. Aur unhone ye maan rakha hai ki unke jo pathak hain wo bilkul ullu ke patthe hain. Ha? Unko pata hi nahi hai ki logon ko kavita ke bare mein batana achhi baat hai. क्योंकि लोगों को सभ्य बनाना अच्छी बात है और ऐसे कौन से सभ्य लोग होंगे जिनको कविता की समझ नहीं है 
और बार बार ये कहा जाता है वो तो कविता में उनकी दिलचस्पी नहीं है हमारा इलेक्ट्रॉनिक मीडिया भी यही करता है तो दोनों मीडिया मिल के कविता के से लोगों को विरत करने पर तुले हुए हैं ये तो भला हो जयपुर साहित्य समारोह जैसे आयोजनों का कि बहुत सारे युवा लोगों को ये पता चलता है कि कविता हमारी हमसे बात करती है हम कविता को समझ सकते हैं कविता में ऐसा कोई बड़ा भारी रहस्य नहीं है और अगर थोड़ा बहुत रहस्य है भी तो कुछ आपको भी तो अपनी तरफ से करना चाहिए आखिर आप हाथ पे हाथ धरे बैठे रहें और कवि लोग ही सब कुछ करें ये कोई बात हुई ओके वेल आई एम नाउ गोइंग टू आस्क नील बिकॉज़ नील टीचेस इंग्लिश एंड ही इज आल्सो इन एनी यूनिवर्सिटी ही इज आल्सो अ पोएट एंड आई आई थिंक आई वांट टू आस्क हिम रियली अबाउट हिज इमेज ऑफ पोएट्रीज चेंजिंग रोल इन सोसाइटी आई एम गोइंग टू ट्राई एंड explain why i think poets certainly myself have mixed feelings about the distance between the poet and the reader and uh again i'm this is a sort of fast forward speeded up history of poetry that will probably be quite parochially european but might also be true of the world in many ways and the poet begins in this you have to um believe me uh is if i tell you this parable really the poet begins as a spokesperson for um a social group and it may be a court or it may be a country or a village or whatever it may be but he is in a sense acting as part of a group and he is chosen perhaps because he is better at expressing what other people would like to think or think they think and so on but the the difference i think came this is i'm going to revert to uh, the U- european literary history but i think this the european literary history is actually in a sense colonized and covered the world so this is not going to be too narrowly parochial i hope what happened was in the romantic period let's say the beginning of the 19th century in europe poetry took a distance from people and uh, for the strangest of reasons which are social historical and perhaps inexplicable poets became deviants they became exiles they distanced themselves and also they became individuals and they separated themselves almost deliberately from courts from towns and went to the countryside I and mean, you'll be familiar probably with Wordsworth and people like that and it's a pattern that is european now that meant also that a different kind of speech was being spoken by the poets they were no longer speaking for people they were speaking for themselves and also what was valuable in what they said was what was different from what other selves thought so then poets became exiles and also in a sense socially deviant and also this meant in a way that something that was a psychological and personal uh speech became poetry now we still cherish this aspect of poetry it's been built into poetry because poetry also wishes to be deviant it doesn't just wish to be new to be original it wishes to be almost rebellious so to be rebellious you need to open a gap So that's why we have mixed feelings I think we don't want to become very popular we on the other hand don't want to be unknown we don't want to be unheard but there is I think a creative tension in the necessary gap that there is between people and poetry and here we are socializing poetry and it's wonderful to see people uh looking at poetry and listening What, what, what do you want? Okay, what do I want? Well, I wanted particularly the first time I met Arvind and I heard him read. Um, he was reading from um, translations, yes. and so I'd quite like to ask him because this is a country that word mixed you've just used. I think this is an incredibly important um, word for poetry. We we live in a mixed society, a multiple society, and. Um, I want to know about what you think about about translation particularly when poetry is in a here is in India is in a country where lots of people are writing and lots of valuable poetry in lots of different languages you know I uh, I came uh, when I started writing uh, in English the the question I was often asked was why don't you write in Hindi because I I you know I was I've lived in Allahabad all my life and hindi was was all all around me but and when i started writing english surprisingly was on its way out in 1964 english had a very short future and the, it had no future whatsoever 
So when I started writing in English, people said, why don't you switch over to Hindi? And I was giving myself a year or two years to write in English. And then I thought I'll make the switch to, to Hindi because English will be booted out of the country. Now that didn't happen, uh, alas. Uh, you know, and uh, so we, we were stuck with English. And as the years went by, more and more people started started using the language. But my relationship with Hindi, you know, I, it, though I did not write in it, there was a great desire to translate the poetry that I. There were no English poets in Allahabad. That was the only English poet for hundreds of miles, I think, in the in 1964. So I started translating some Hindi poetry, and this is something which I've continued to do uh, all my life. So I think, and I, and I also think it's hugely important to translate from these languages, uh, Indian languages, into, uh, into English. Or if you have other, if you are better in your Indian language, to trans translate from English into those languages. And one last word is that I absolutely see no difference between my own work and my translations. I'm often asked, is translation easier? Or, you know, uh, why do you translate when you can write your own poems? Now, the fact of the matter is, I translate because I cannot write my own poems all the time. Which, that is one reason. And the other reason is, when I'm translating, I actually forget that I'm working on a translation. At that moment, I'm working on, on, on a poem. And I, there are times when I have to, you know, come back and look at it again and see, well, if this is a translation after all. But when you're actually working on a poem, you work on it as, as hard as you would on your own poem. And, uh, and, and the problems are the same. The problems are simply of finding the right word. So th those problems are the same whether you're writing your own poem or you are doing a translation. Thank you. Oh, yes. Fantastic, thank you. Yes, well, at this point, I just want to say one thing happened to me yesterday when I was, I did a reading with other people, and that was wonderful. And someone came up to me af afterwards and asked me, what was the message of my poems? And I thought afterwards, I thought about that a long time, and I thought, well, actually, if a poem thinks it has a message, then it's not a very good poem. Um, a poem is lots of things all the time. It's like a rainbow and it's, it's, it's like lots of different things. But um, when you're writing a poem, you don't want to think, uh, this is the message I want to give out. Because in that case, the message has won. And the poem that you're working on has got to be this self-delighting thing called poetry, which is what Arvind is, is working on when he's, when, when you're putting words together, that is working on a poem. It's not a message, that's what I was thinking. But the next, now, we've got Jeet here. We've got two people here who write poems and novels. And um, I wondered if Jeet could say a little bit first about um, what he thinks the function of, of poetry is in society. Sure. Um, also, it occurs to me that the whole idea of a poem carrying a message is a is a mistaken, really, because for messages we go to um, email, Gmail for messages, poetry for other stuff. Um, the function of poetry. I I I remember I was in uh, New York during 9/11, and. Uh, in the months, the weeks and months after 9-11, I was um, surprised and gratified to see poetry make an appearance in the New York Times for the first time in my memory or in the, in the time that I was in America. First time I saw a poem in the New York Times. And uh, I, that made a perfect sense because poetry, uh, I think, plays the function of prayer in a godless society. Um, what prayer used to give us, poems may give us today. It fills uh, the God-shaped hole left in us by the absence of God. It, uh, it also does what song is supposed to do, which is to give you in a catchy and a memorable way something that tells you about what it means to be alive in the world. Um, both a seemingly negligible and neglected functions, but uh, enormously important when you are in a crisis. I, I just want to, to come back to a little bit to Jeet on that before we get to Kevin and Vijay. Um, Ashok said in, in his talk about Arandas's speech, this holy art of poetry, 
But yesterday on stage, he whispered to me, last year I was reading in Krakow in a gilt church, and he, he said, how strange that this unholy thing called poetry could be, um, could be performed in a church. So there's this, this very, very interesting thing which is raised. I mean, I'm sure what Jeet is saying is that it, it is not true in this day and age that somebody who believes devoutly in any god cannot write a poem. <laughs> just to clarify, um, but and, and also that you you believe it's both holy and unholy, yeah, yeah, sure. and so this mixed stuff. Okay, one minute. Well, what happened was they were celebrating the birth centenary of Cheshwami Vosh, a great Polish poet who was also a Nobel laureate, and it was uh, Shimborska, the another Nobel laureate, and I and the two other poets, and we were reading in this church. This church. I was told, is studded with gold. It is the most golden church in a Roman Catholic country. And I was reading for the first time in a church, in a holy place. So I was driven to thank the organizers, saying that I am so grateful you gave me opportunity in my life first to read my poems in a place surrounded by so much gold. I had never seen so much gold in my life anyway, and unlikely to see it later. And secondly, I had never read in a holy place. And I think poetry is an unholy art. So thanks for providing a temporary residence to an unholy art in a holy place. That's what happened. So I think we'll go back to Jeets. I hope we'll go back to Jeets definition of poetry and prayer in a way. But now I want to turn to Kevin, um, because Kevin, you've written um, about your wartime experience, both in a novel and in poems. Can you say a little bit about what, what bits of your experience went into one and the other? Uh, yeah, I mean, I didn't um, move to, you know, from one form to, to the other in any programmatic way. It seemed that... Um, you know, with poems, I was reacting to images that were occupying my mind and, and um, trying to create a space where someone else could, could recognize the image um, that, that I was wrestling with. Uh, it was in interesting. I was thinking about um, the immediacy of a poem and the way one can fall in love with a poem without really comprehending um, the ideas that are being communicated without necessarily getting the message. Um, and I had that experience yesterday, yesterday listening to poems in Hindi and Rajasthani. Uh, maybe it won't surprise you to know that I don't understand Hindi or Rajasthani. But listening to these poems, I felt this incredible degree of confidence that, that had I just been walking by and heard these voices, I would have immediately recognized that what I was hearing was poetry. And so it seems to me that, um, that there's a way in which poetry, it doesn't always have to be about comprehension. It can about, be about apprehension, uh, the immediacy of perception before it gets filtered through our, through our mind. Um, I think back to, you know, my discovery with one of the first my first encounter with one of the poets that, that I loved when I was about 12, Dylan Thomas, and opening a book in a used bookstore and seeing the force that through the green fuse drives the flower, drives my green age. I had no clue what it meant. I, I don't know if I have a clue what it means now, but I was excited and fascinated by it. So, so for me, when I'm, when I'm writing prose, I think I'm hoping that the reader will have a space where immersion is possible. Um, and when I'm working on a poem, I hope there's some kind of immediate transfer of energy that can happen. Um, you know, I, I also think back to the question of, of difficulty and the way that we are sort of pre pre presented with the difficulty of poetry. And, you know, for me, I. I developed this love of the, the sonic qualities and the rhythmic qualities of, of poets without really understanding what I was getting into as a reader when I was young. And then I got to high school and um, 
They said, this is a poem by T.S. Eliot. It's called The Wasteland, and you don't understand it. And that's the way that it was presented to me. They said, they presented it to me as if its only value was as a problem to be solved, that my immediate engagement with the language wasn't enough. And of course, as one develops a relationship with, with poetry, your, your understanding can deepen, and there are many facets and layers with which to engage with a poem, but uh, I, I feel like the difficulty comes because that immediate engagement with, with words banging up against each other and resonating and the sound of the human voice is, is very often devalued today. Um, but I am incredibly encouraged to see so many people here who, who are obviously interested in and love poetry the way that, that I imagine we all do up here. Thank you, Kevin. Well, um, <clears throat> when we were reading yesterday, um, before we read, there was a Rajasthani poet called Vishvivit Prithvijit Singh. And I asked him through my naturalist friend um, in Hindi, I would like to know a little bit about rhyming in Rajasthani verse and how, what relationships the words make. And as far as I understood his answer translated to me, he said this wonderful thing, he said, the similarities are inside the line. And I think we, we can't, we've only got you know, a little bit of time to do something that people have been arguing about for 3,000 years. So, and we're doing it with nearly 3,000 people as far as it looks to me. But I wanted to ask Vijay a little bit about craft, because when poets get together, in the end, what, what it comes down to is how we use this word you use, banging up together how you put the words together, how you make the relationship of sound into a bigger meaning than any word can have on its own. And that's an extraordinary thing which people found to do very early on, possibly before cave painting. Um, but how do we do it now? And what is, the, what is the relation, would you say, Vijay, to this craft which we all share of, of um, the diminishing role in a society where the pop song, the film, all sorts of things have taken over some of the original functions of poetry. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I want to say that I don't think poetry is any, in any sort of crisis and uh, it doesn't have to deign to compete with any other medium. Uh, because I would say, getting back to the issue of craft, Ruth, that the thing we serve, you know, I mean, I think a lot of people would sort of, not a lot of people, but some people would disagree with Jeet that it's a form of prayer in a godless age, you know. I mean, I don't think I would agree with that. What I would say, and I guess I, if I want to put it sort of as broadly as possible, that the living spirit of the human being is language and that poetry is the art that preeminently serves language and all of the other activities of language you know use language instrumentally but we use language for its own sake for its beauty for its perfection and some of us write poems that as kevin said can be apprehended without being understood but that's because the living spirit of the language flows through them and everything that has to do with craft is either corollary or subsidiary to that love of uh, language itself and I think one of the things I mean we're always talking as poets about you know poetry being problematic because we as poets we all need a lot of love and we feel like the love is being given to the fiction writers and the historians and not being given to us you know, but uh, you know underneath all of that I think we all recognize that what we're doing is a very very powerful thing it's a very very important thing and it's sort of the primary thing that this is the primary language art out of which all, which all the other language arts come. And the crafts that we employ are the crafts that are employed by prose writers in a more diluted way. 
Yeah, so, uh, yeah. I'm not down in the mouth about poetry at all. I think, you know, my God. And this is a great era for poetry, I think, the world over. Yes, thank you. I, mean, I, I agree. I mean, I, um, but what Ajit said about 9-11, I mean, there were huge poetry readings in the New York after 9-11. And I think it's every poet's experience. Probably a great number of you are poets, and probably you've had this experience too. When somebody is bereaved, when somebody's mother dies or something, or they want to celebrate a wedding, what did they do, having sort of not noticed your poetry at all? They suddenly turn to you and say, do you know a poem we could read at the funeral, at the wedding? And at those moments when, when human life is sort of felt suddenly to be most important and to shared to be most important, that's when people turn to poetry. Um, so I think that sort of bears, bears um, BJ out. Um, anything else anybody wants to say? We, we, Yes, and then we, we, will, we, have, we will have 10 minutes for questions. There will be roving mics, and obviously they can't rove into the center of all of you. So um, I've been told that probably we'll take them just from here, and I'm sorry, people at the back. Um, send your questions in to, to teamwork. Okay, one more, one more thing from Ashok. I, I wanted to say two things. I heard a Spanish poet say, Poetry is not a matter of rhyme, it's a matter of courage in the first place. And secondly, since you, so many of us, are you here and you have heard these poets and these books are available in the shops, so better see to it that not a single copy remains unsold. Thank you. <laughs> in fact, uh, when we decided that we were going to read from poems, we discovered that Vijay was not carrying his book and we asked uh, for a copy of his book to be sent from the bookshop. They are all sold out. Wow. Okay. So can we have some questions? Yes, there's one here, a gentleman here, and then a lady here in the pink hat. Hello. Uh, thank you all the listeners for starting this. Uh, I have a question. Uh, in the keynote speech, uh, one, person, one distinguished personality was saying, uh, acknowledged uh, the poetry, uh, poets are the uh, legislators of the unacknowledged world. Unacknowledged and the other person is saying, legislators are the, uh, they are the legislators of the unacknowledged world. So there's a kind of... Unacknowledged legislators of the universe. Unacknowledged legislators of the universe is one poet saying, the other poet saying, Acknowledged legislators of the unacknowledged world. So, so basically, there is some kind of unacknowledgement, even in the minds of the bigwigs who have given the keynote speech on that day. That's point number one. Now, even in India right now, the notion still is, as Ma'am has told in his book, Thomas the Rhymer, Thomas the Poet. Still the same feeling: no anapis, no ducktail, nothing. So, how can we popularize poetry among the young generation in India? Especially from the internet age, American way of English is coming in a big way to India, and most of the old poetry is still in British literature. So, with this kind of confusion, it's going to add more to confusion. So, how can we handle this? How can we popularize poetry among the young India? Because if I see previously before the internet age, defaulter means defaulting, but if I see in an internet age, by default, has somewhat different meaning. So how can we popularize India in this, uh, the poetry in India? This one. Well, before I hand it over to my Indian colleagues, poet language, any language, the thing that we are all in love with, the thing that we are grasping to be in love with something else beyond this thing, is always changing. And a poet needs to work in the language that they are living in. You can't work in an old, in, in somebody else's language, you have to work in your own voice. Um, but would anybody like to? Yeah, I'll I mean, I've been thinking about this, you know, since I was back in Mumbai in November, that there seems to be a sort of relative lack of institutional support for poetry. Would that be the way to put it in India? I mean, I don't really know the Indian situation, but it strikes me that that is the case. That's understating things. 
Yeah, that's understating it. I'm trying to be polite here, you know. And no, don't be. Okay. You know, but what I would say, there are probably two conditions, two reasons for that. And one is uh, a kind of, a re well, I, okay, I won't be polite. One is a stupid reason, which is that somehow poetry is not commercial. And that makes a kind of simple one-to-one -one equation between what is valuable to a society and what is commercial. You know, what is kind of, what can sell a lot. And there are many things that are valuable to the cohesion of Indian democracy and the Indian Republic and the Indian people that aren't necessarily immediately sellable. And people have to understand, you know, that poetry creates the conditions of the possibility of a certain kind of civic society. That, uh, and it's crucial to that. You know, the other reason I think is not a stupid reason, which is this is a language, how many, of, this is a country with how many official languages? Is it 14, 22? The number always keeps changing, right? And then there are 200 dialects and they're all, they all want to be a language. You know, so the consciousness of the Indian population is partitioned in all of these ways linguistically. And I think what Ruth was saying is absolutely right. You know, I mean, if you, if you went to interior Karnataka, if you went to Kerala, if you went to Rajasthan and saw the Rajasthani speakers who are really deeply involved in the language, I'm sure you'd find tremendous poetry there in all the vernaculars. And, you know, and so what we're really talking about is Indian po English poetry, you know, and the popularity of English poetry, but everybody who is an English speaker here is also speaking another language. They also have a mother tongue, right? And I think that complicates the issue of the dissemination of poetry and its proper appreciation and judgment. And, but that's not the problem of poetry. And it's not the problem of India because it's sort of the glory of India, but it's also a maddening aspect of Indian society. And, you know, and that might be the reason why there will always be a certain impediment to the kind of popularity one feels poetry should have in the subcontinent. Thank you, and I, I, I like to learn from that, but, but before we come to the other question, when I have, this is just in English, I teach English to university students in King's College in London, and they're 18, they're 19, and they talk to each other on their mobile phones and they use all sorts of words that I don't know the meanings of because they're 18 and I'm not, but when they start to write a poem, a lot of them will write as if they were Tennyson. They will use archaic word order, inverse wor word order. And I say, you've got to write a poem out of the words your voice is in, the words you would use to your friend on the mobile phone. So you've got to, your language is your language, your voice is your voice. And language comes out of you. Okay, let's have another one. Uh, I have a slight disagreement to one, one of your, uh, the whole discussion. You said the poem doesn't have a message. I believe that when you, when, when anyone reads a poem and the way a person personally interprets it, each and every one will take a separate message from it. One, two, uh, and, and why that message is important is because in a country like India, where we need to find ways of promoting social causes, poetry, poetry could come in very handy. Uh, while promoting those social causes. Yeah. That, is, that is my belief. Thank you very much. Well, those are two very interesting points of view. And the first is, I completely agree. When any of us read a poem, I don't know how many hundreds you are, you are, thousand you are, but each of you will go away with something different. I don't know if that is going to be a message or not, but you will come away with something different, some meaning that has been... Between you and the poem. 
Um, but the second thing, the poetry, poetry will come in handy. That, I don't think any single one here will want this that, be because right art should not serve public right opinion. Target. It should entertain, yeah, it challenge, oh amuse, deepen, enhance, but not serve it. I mean, you know, Hitler was using poetry and art as propaganda. That's when art becomes propaganda. So I, I don't know what other people, Jeet. I just wanted to uh, repeat Vijay's joke, may I? Yes, go. Yeah, um, it's very gratifying to be at a poetry panel uh, with a, with a warm-up act like V.S. Naipaul. <laughs> Anybody else want to go in with the... Okay, we've got some more questions here. Um, we've got... Oh, this is the last question, so you're, you're going to have to make your choice. Okay, standing up there with glasses. Yeah, there? I'll see who. Oh. No, 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 it's for him. Yeah, yeah. Give it to him. It's his. That's his. Okay. No. Hello. No, no, sorry. No, no, no. Sorry. sorry. Let me ask from Ashok, sir. You want to hear him? Or no, him? we can't hear him. Can we, can he we stole the mic. It's his question. He stole the mic. It's My the question other guy's is from question. Ashok, sir. It's, it's not just. Watch bike, sir. What? Yeah. Sir, my question is from yeah, you. Generally, we see song. that uh, in today's arena what? in India, he stole the yeah, he stole as if the, uh, the many of the motivating poems are there, likely the youth and the, in the society to motivate us, uh, you do consider the peculiar tips to get us into the mountain peaks and all. Uh, but generally, the youth is more above correlated about the novels and fixies and uh, many of the things uh, uh, from the realistic approach. Okay, can we, thank you. Can you pass the mic on to him? Please. Please. Pass the mic on to him. Okay. Do you want to answer him? Hello. Thank you so much for your cooperation. Um, so, the idea of being a poet is that you want your voice to be heard. But um, I'm asking posing questions to all of you. Um, in, you know, how often do you find yourself compromising your personal vision in an attempt to broach styles or themes or ideas that could get you recognition to a wider audience? And if you do so, is it worth it? Can you answer that and, and weave in the other questions? I don't know what you say, but you seem to think that there is a vision which the poet approximates. The point of the fact is most of us discover the vision through writing. We don't have a vision already given to us by whoever. The vision is articulated, ex discovered, explored, innovated through writing. Writing is not the product, it is a process. Uh, that the poem is a product at the end is fine. But while writing, we do not know what is going to happen. Those who know what is going to happen write bad poetry. I'm so, 